This week we are going to look at what is essentially considered postmodern literature, which brings any form of literature up into today, and this idea of dystopian literature. And dystopian literature is essentially anything that shows the world in some form of control. If we think about uh, 1984, which we're currently reading, that is a dystopian piece where there is a totalitarian government in place. One of the most important questions, though, of course, is what is postmodern lit or what is postmodern literature? <laughs> and it follows this idea that there isn't something that can be tied up into a neat little package, but it says that according to this criteria, everything has already been done. Every story has been told. Nothing is original anymore. Um, all the genres are made. Anything that we do today can be connected with something in the past. By contrast, dystopian literature is a specific genre of fictional writing, and it's used to explore the social and political structures in a dark nightmare type of world. When they use the term dystopia, it's defined as a society characterized by poverty, squalor, or oppression. And this theme is most commonly used in science fiction and in speculative fiction, which would be what 1984 is. It's kind of a what if. Um, if we think of Dick Phillips, The Man in the High Castle, that's more of a what if America had lost World War II and America had been split into a Nazi Reich and into a Japanese control on the West Coast. Some characteristics of postmodernism that we're going to look at are the intertextuality, um, metafiction, fetiche, maximalism, irony, hyperreality, paranoia, fragmentation, which we actually looked at in modernism, post World War II and how that affected it, and this idea of late capitalism and how that has affected the postmodern literature idea. When we first look at the intertextuality of something, this is an idea that says that there are two relationships whenever we read a text. There's a relationship between us and the author, and there's also a relationship between the text and other texts. And this relationship between us and the author is our perception, what do we get out of it, what connections do we make, do we empathize with the character. The relationship between the text and other texts is this idea that how does previous work shape the current work that we're reading or how do works in the same genre compare to each other. No piece of literature and no book is ever essentially on its own. It's never alone. It never lives in isolation. And we particularly say that nowadays that literature is made with things that already exist because they're taking from material that already exists. It's already there. Nothing is new. Now, it also tries to look at whether the author is in full control of the text and whether the reader plays the average, plays an active role. So overall, the rules essentially are that the author weaves together the story, so they create the story. And readers make the mental connection, so that's their empathy, that's their response to the other text. Looking at metafiction, this is an idea that emphasizes the fact that it's fiction. It's 100% fiction. The authors aren't necessarily worried about creating the content. It is simply the idea that, yep, everything's false. We're not necessarily, we may make it realistic, but we're not worried about whether or not the time period is right. We're not worried about if we're giving historical facts. This is all fiction. So you could think of something like an alien abduction story, um, a criminal case, things like that. So with this, usually what they tend to do is write stories about stories instead of getting bogged down and looking at what is real and authentic. They're just going to tell the story to tell the story. When we look at Patish, that is essentially 
when we look at it, it's almost like a collage. It's not creating something from scratch, but you're using what already exists to create something new. So it tries to, which we can say like a fictional story um, with existing characters, that could be like the Wicked series that takes the Wizard of Oz and turns it on its head. Um, we have dystopian literature about a world government, so a totalitarian idea. But Fatish also mimics various forms of literature, so it tries to imitate it. Um, it's almost like playing dress up, so you can do um, like a detective novel, a spy adventure. Um, they can and they can add in, you know, a genre of dystopianism. They can add in a genre of uh, fiction, romance, history, pretty much anything. It does try to adopt the thematic material of the original, but it doesn't comment or make fun of it. And it usually pays tribute to that idea if they're taking anything from somewhere else. The characteristic of maximalism is embracing excess. Um, so this can be in lengthy descriptions, um, in which case you have like five or six hundred page novels. Um, it can also involve where people go off on tangents, so they don't necessarily stick to the traditional ideas of plotting, setting, narrative structure. Um, they're always adding in a bunch of subplots. But with this particular characteristic, it does give the author a chance to experiment because they're able to go between what might be considered authentic and unauthentic. Um, they can throw everything in. They don't necessarily have to worry about what's real, false, or plausible or implausible. They can just write. When we look at irony, a literal definition of irony is a contrast between expectations of a situation as one as reality. Now, in regards to literature, this can have a deeper meaning. Um, in a lot of cases, it's usually the difference between the situation and reality. So in literature, if we were to look at Winston, for example, um, his situation is he lives in a totalitarian government. His reality is very similar, but he keeps thinking he can have a better life, which in reality probably isn't the case. So he does have an ironic play on that. Sometimes irony can be seen like sarcasm. Um, it can sometimes be playful or used to highlight absurdity or severity of the situations. Um, but generally, this type has died down after World War II. Um, most literary scholars believe it's because a lot of people didn't see irony um, as having a place in regards to being sarcastic or being funny um, after the horrors that were witnessed after World War II and the death and destruction associated with that. The characteristic of hyperreality um, isn't necessarily just about experimental art, experimental fiction. Um, it kind of creates what some literary scholars have called a matrix style scenario, in which case there's no such thing as originality. So there's no more original ideas. If you think of something that you think is an original thought, chances are there's a connection to something in the past. So what is real is essentially like a simulation if you and you could think if any of you've seen the matrix movies he thinks he's living in 1999 but in fact he's living in a computer simulation that makes him think it's 1999 things like that so the authors in a sense try to define reality in their books you know what is real what is original the idea of paranoia is that thinking that someone is out to get you. And we can see that into in some of the novels when we look at characters. Um, Winston is a very good example. We see paranoia sneaking in periodically throughout 1984. Um, much of this idea as a characteristic grew out of the um, rapid development of technology, of consumerism, of the media. Um, we start to see things that um, if technology is going into overdrive, people are powerless. Um, there's kind of this equation within paranoia where if you have technology and you add in distrust, it means that um, Big Brother is watching, to use 1984 uh, rhetoric. And so the idea is that your life isn't your own. 
it's controlled so you really don't have any freedom and the freedom you have is what is given to you by the technology or whomever is in charge or in control of your life at that point. The ideas of fragmentation we do see in the sense of modernism and postmodernism. But in postmodernism, the idea of fragmentation is to try and um, essentially reflect and explore the chaos in the world. So that can be breaks in your story, breaks in your paragraph. It can be breaks in your structure or your insight in the sense that there is no grand meaning to the narrative that's being created. They're just reflecting on what's going on and trying to show the chaos that they're indicating in their story. World War II is a turning point for between the eras of modern and postmodern literature. With all of the death and technological advances and the Holocaust that happened with World War II, it very much had a psychological impact on the way people wrote and also changed the cultural landscape. Um, you'll start to, you will start to see changes in word usage from before 1945 and after 1945 in describing certain people. Certain ideas of stories are not told for a certain period of time. But it does bring in new forms of literature. Um, 1945 really is where you start to see that birth of postmodernism and this idea of dystopian literature that really pops up. When we think of capitalism, we think of the industrialization and consumerism that's in everyday life. And so when we have this idea of late capitalism, it's essentially where you look at things like the mass media, globalism, big corporations, and that all coming together to influence how you're going to make your decisions every day. Um, it also kind of refers to the idea that with all of these things going around, um, humans tend to get a little lost. They really don't have a center anymore. Man no longer is the center. We could say the media is, or technology is, or consumerism is. So originality and authenticity don't necessarily seem possible as much because we're dealing with all of this idea. Postmodernism doesn't necessarily focus on creativity. They almost argue that there's a hollow world because everything has been rejected and it's just being replaced by images or this idea of globalism. When we look at some characteristics seen in dystopian literature, most of the time these involve dramatic changes to society. And that can involve such as a war, a revolution, an uprising, overpopulation, a natural disaster, or some other climactic and catastrophic event. We'll also see it where you have um, a standard of living that's generally lower than what it would be today. It's not always the case, but that's a lot of times what we'll see. Um, usually your main character starts to question society. They feel and have this sense that intuitively something is very wrong. Um, most of the time we see advanced technology that controls or oppresses the population. Dystopian fiction also tends to extrapolate current trends. Um, so really it kind of shows you it's not really enough to show you living in an unpleasant society. You have to have similarities to today so that way it can be identified as, oh, this might happen. This could happen later on. And one other element that we generally see is this idea of state control, which we'll see in 1984 because the state is in full control of everyone in the party and of the proletariat section of society. Some themes we're going to look at a little bit in dystopian literature are environmental destruction, nuclear disaster, government control, religious control, technological control, survival, and loss of individualism. When we think of the economic destruction, this is becoming a lot more common today in young adult fiction. Um, 
So it's kind of embracing this. But some of the environmental changes we might see are uh, peak oil crisis, global warming, deforestation, um, extreme weather, an ice age. Um, we could even argue um, a nuclear explosion that caused everyone to move underground, things like that. Which would then tie into nuclear disaster, which are essentially books that um, take place in an area that's been obliterated or no longer inhabitable and destroyed by nuclear war or a nuclear holocaust. In a lot of cases, your characters are living in ruins or they could be in an underground shelter. Um, they could even be in a post-nuclear world living in very primitive surroundings, in which case man is reduced to primitive ideas. Or we're seeing how they're having to deal with radiation, the effects of that, and the conditions. Um, generally, this world that's created is very controlled and many people live in fear. The most common theme is this idea of government control. Um, the government can be, is most of the time, the cause of the problem, but it can sometimes also be the result in the case of like a nuclear disaster in a story, for example, then the government could come in and take full control. So that's a result of a disaster, not that they just came in and had a coup. Um, as a result of this government control, and a lot of times your population, you start to see the changes in their living conditions, there's a lot of environmental destruction, they lose their individualism. And because of that, we usually see a revolution or a civil war as a common reaction in these types of books to counteract that government control. Along with government control is this idea of religious control, where religion is the center of the culture. And it follows a very similar line to government control in the sense that the religion controls the population by making them fear that certain actions or characteristics are sins or blasphemies. So it creates those rules that determine whether or not your actions, characteristics, and behaviors are right. Um, if you were to put this modernly, um, think of a religious cult that has a certain set of rules that you have to follow. That's kind of the idea of religious control in a dystopian novel. In a lot of cases, um, that control, your um, protagonist, your main character here, usually tries to flee from the control or attempts to lead a revolt and change that religious control. We also have technological control, which is usually mixed with another theme um, to create that dystopian idea. Um, sometimes we'll see, you know, governments in control with technology or AI taking over the world. And that can be done with physical um, control of the characters where you have um, like technology uh, keeping watch on where you're going and what you're doing. Um, we have city limitations in the sense that there's um, electronic fences around a city that can all be done with technology. But it can also be a mental control, whereas you have mind control um, by technology, and that could be seen with some dystopian ideas of implants in human beings or um, computer chips, AI, thing like, things like that. Um, survival in dystopian novels as a theme really isn't a surprise. Um, most often, um, the quest for survival is the result of one of the themes, such as government control, religious control, etc. Um, they have to live through these controls, they have to survive through them. And what makes that story exciting and gives it unexpected twists and turns is that quest to change the control, that quest to survive and keep yourself. It also flows into this last theme of loss of individualism. Now that can be, it's found in many of them, and it can be a loss of physical appearance, um, such as everyone having the same clothing or the same hairstyle, um, as we see in 1984. Or it could be a loss of individual choice, such as um, in The Giver, where the people in charge decide what section of the world you're going to have a job. It may also involve what products you're going to sell. It could involve who you're going to marry and when, things like that. Um, most of the time in dystopian novels, your 
loss of individualism usually goes unnoticed until someone recognizes that there's a different way to live, they want to live that way, and they start to raise awareness in others. So as we look at some of these books that are associated with that, um, most common in dystopian is 1984, and this was published shortly after World War II in 1949 by George Orwell. Uh, the book technically takes place in London, but you wouldn't necessarily know that. It follows the main character of Winston, and it looks at the idea of government control, technological control. It makes you notice that Big Brother is watching, so it also brings in that theme of paranoia as well, because Big Brother is watching everything you do. They can, they can hear your thoughts. They can see what you're buying. They can see whether or not you're actually following through on that party line. Um, the Handmaid's Tale was written in 1985 by Margaret Atwood. Um, this tends to follow Alfred in the eastern United States, um, what was previously the United States. In this case, you have government control from a different ideal. This story's background is that there was a political party elected um, in light of an infertility problem. They eventually took over the entire United States and women who were fertile or could have children would be given to upper class families to bear their children for them. And so this brings in this dystopian idea of essentially survival, slavery, you, you lose your identity. Of Fred as a character, if you were to literally take the name, means of Fred, meaning that she has no individual name. Her name is of the person that she is serving. Um, the Hunger Games, uh, written by Suzanne Collins over a period of a couple years with a three-part trilogy, uh, geared more towards teens, but it has been made into movies since then, following the character of Katniss in Pan Am, which was previously the United States, which deals with government control after a nuclear disaster, in which case they send children from every district to basically have a social Darwinism survival of the fittest fight that is televised worldwide in order to keep the rebellions down, which will eventually result in a rebellion. We have another dystopian novel known as Fahrenheit 451. This was published by Ray Bradbury in 1953. Uh, it does follow his main character of Guy Montag. And in this book in particular, you have government control, but it's from a different perspective. In this case, the government will go in and instead of firemen, quote, fighting fires, the firemen actually now go in and burn books. They burn uh, whole libraries. All books are bad. They'll also do your entire, they'll burn your entire house down if you have to. And at one point, um, Montag actually steals a Bible. And uh, he keeps it in his house and he starts getting paranoid that the government will find it. Um, eventually, he is found out that he does have this book. Um, his house is burned down, his wife leaves him, and Montag flees to a group of what are called drifters. And in this book, these are individuals who memorize books. And Montag stays with them, studies with them, and then toward the end of the novel, um, the city that Montag fled from is actually bombed into oblivion, but the drifters survive. So then they actually decide to head back to the city to try and rebuild it because they have memorized this wisdom. They've memorized these books that have burned. And that was always what was so shocking, particularly when the Nazis came through in World War II and started burning books. Everyone was very shocked and hurt because you're losing that sense of culture or history or knowledge that those authors would have given you at the time. A Clockwork Orange was written in 1962 by Anthony Burgess. Follows his character Alex. Um, the main plot we see here in this idea is the idea of extreme violence, and we do see a very subtleness of government control involved in this 
novel. Um, it's a combination of psychological thriller and uh, keeping people on their toes. Um, he combines a lot of English and Russian words in this particular novel um, within this totalitarian government that he creates. He has what's known as a NADSAT, which is essentially a teen. The book is essentially controlled by a repressive totalitarian superstate. Um, most citizens are just complacent. They're blind to the uh, growth of a rampant um, violent youth culture. Alex is part of this culture. Eventually he commits a crime where he ends up in prison. He is then um, severely tortured in prison, um, but he tends to like classical music, gets interested in the Bible, and then he agrees to submit to an experimental technique known as Lukotovico's technique, which is a form of brainwashing that tries to incorporate associative learning. So when he has a thought of being violent, he gets, for example, an electroshock. So that way, anytime he he'll come to associate violence with pain or nausea and sickness. It's a way of government and population control in order to control the violence. Um, unfortunately, because of this consequence, um, before the treatment, Alex liked classical music. Now he doesn't because he always associated with the violence and so now classical music makes him sick. And so Alex is very distressed with this. But that particular side effect doesn't bother the government because Alex's treatment was a victory for law and order and they now have population and crowd control. So this Alex's successful treatment then pushes the government to issue this on a rampant scale, which we see in dystopian. So postmodernism looks at literature saying nothing is original. Dystopian looks at literature and says, what if, you know, what if the world is dark and nightmarish. What if government was in control? What if there was a religion in control? What would happen if there was a nuclear holocaust? How would people live? And so with all these various types of literature, there are ways of telling a story. You can interweave different plot points. You can interweave different character settings, these different themes. But one thing that seems to always come back, particularly in most novels, is this idea of survival, or as you start to get more modern, this idea of individualism. So as we wrap up literature, we will take the last section of the semester and look at art and architecture. And if you guys have any questions about the work this week, please let me know.